Hello everyone, welcome back to Women in Film Reviews. My name is Helen and today we are going to be taking a look at the 2019 documentary film Knock Down the House. This is a film directed by documentarian Rachel Lears and she also wrote and produced it alongside her partner Robin Blotnick. It received rave reviews at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival and it was later purchased by Netflix who released it on their platform in May 2019. Following the 2016 presidential election, there was a lot of concern about the future of the Democratic Party, especially concerning the establishment party favorites and the progressives who backed Bernie Sanders for president. This documentary follows four candidates recruited by the organization's brand new Congress and Justice Democrats to run in the 2018 midterm elections. They are as follows. Cori Bush, who is running for the U.S. congressional seat in Missouri's first district that is currently held by incumbent Democrat Lacey Clay. Paula Jean Swearingen, who is running for the U.S. Senate seat held by incumbent Democrat Joe Manchin. Amy Valela, who was running in an open Democratic primary for the U.S. congressional seat of Nevada's 4th District, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is running for, and later wins, the seat of New York's 14th congressional district that is held by incumbent Democrat Joe Crowley. At this point, Crowley was the fourth most powerful Democrat in Congress, and this primary was the first that he had faced in over a decade. The aim of these candidates, alongside others promoted by brand new Congress and Justice Democrats, was to run campaigns and elect people based on grassroots movements as opposed to big donors, and ultimately to make the voices of everyday working Americans heard in Congress again. This documentary follows the candidates in the midst of their primary campaigns, highlighting the struggles of running a campaign that isn't backed by big donors or the party establishment, but by the people that they are running to represent. Before I continue with this review, I think it is incredibly important for me to be open about my stance on the various issues mentioned throughout this movie and that the candidates have built their platforms on. I support a woman's right to choose. This includes access to safe abortion procedures as well as affordable access to contraceptive methods. I myself have been on the pill for almost two and a half years. I believe in Medicare for all and that the exorbitant cost of healthcare in the United States right now is inexcusable, especially since I have moved to the UK and seen that it is possible to have affordable and accessible healthcare through organizations like the NHS. No one should go into debt over a health crisis. The minimum wage in the United States needs to be raised to $15 an hour, and this must include waiting and tipped staff as well. Black Lives Matter. The entire police system in the United States was founded on racist ideologies. The prison system disproportionately affects black people, and police officers are not being punished for the heinous crimes that they commit against black people. Climate change is a real issue. Corporations are destroying the planet and impoverished people are paying the price for it. We must protect the environment before it is too late. And finally, I stand with my fellow members of the LGBTQIA community and I do not believe that they should be discriminated against because of someone's religious freedom. The Equality Act must pass in this respect. All right, I think that about covers it. I am genuinely afraid to read the comments after this. Oh well. My point in telling you these views is that I am inherently biased toward the subjects of this documentary because they agree with me on certain issues. Whilst I've tried to separate my biases from my opinion on the film as a piece of art, some of that may slip into this review at various points. Right, let's get to it. Knock Down the House initially received publicity because of and was primarily marketed on the involvement of AOC. She has become the face of the progressive movement within the Democratic Party, and she is also one of the most prominent members of Congress in office today. When I sat down to watch the film, I initially had no idea that it involved three other candidates running, and I was pleasantly surprised by the diversity of the races that are being run across the country. We know AOC's story because she was the only elected candidate of this group and she became a celebrity overnight thanks to her victory. But the stories of Cori Bush, Paula Jean Swearingen, and Amy Valela are just as compelling as AOC's and in some cases are more heartbreaking. 
Cori Bush was a nurse who served on the front lines in the Ferguson protests in the aftermath of the wrongful death of Mike Brown in 2014. Paula Jean Swearingen's community has been devastated by big coal companies who have come in, taken over their beautiful land, and left pollution in the air and water that has caused many of the residents of her town to contract cancer. Amy Vallela's daughter died because when she showed up at the hospital to receive emergency treatment for a blood clot, they refused to treat her because she couldn't provide proof of health insurance. All four of these women know that their communities have been left behind by the people that have been elected to represent them, most of them Democrats in this case, and the reason that they are running their campaigns is to become proper voices and advocates for the people that they will represent. While the film is an overall insightful and fascinating look at the struggles of running a grassroots campaign against more powerful people in the same party, I do wish that the documentary had spent more time with each of the four women equally. Much of the focus here is given to AOC's campaign mostly because she has the toughest race to run, but also, I suspect, because the directors know that this is the candidate that their primary audience for this documentary will most likely be interested in. That's not to say that AOC's journey isn't compelling. In an era where she is the most visible Democrat on the House floor at the moment, it is easy to forget that she started out as a waitress living in a small apartment in the Bronx and trying to run her campaign while holding down a full-time job, which is difficult. But because the film focuses primarily on her, I feel like it doesn't give the other three women enough time to shine. That being said, AOC's campaign is a microcosm of the types of obstacles that all of these campaigns face. AOC's opponent, Joe Crowley, is backed by big donors and the party establishment, but as would be the case for someone who went unchallenged in elections for over a decade. He is shown to be completely unequipped to run a campaign, and it is painfully obvious throughout that he is severely out of touch with the community that he is representing in Congress. The debates between Crowley and AOC, one of which he straight up didn't attend and sent a surrogate in his place, highlight AOC's strengths as a congresswoman and as a speaker and an advocate, and painfully highlights his weaknesses. There are some cringeworthy moments on his behalf in this documentary, I'm not going to lie. Watching this, you would think that Alexandria's victory would be all but secured at this point. Why would anyone choose Crowley over this well-spoken and passionate woman? But, as the other candidates prove in their races, which they do lose, it is incredibly tough to get someone to switch their loyalty from someone who has been a sure bet for their party for a long time to someone who might be seen to be a risk. Because of this, these progressive candidates have to work even harder to get their message across to as many of their constituents as they can. The groundwork for these campaigns is something that this documentary takes a laser focus to. Unlike big money candidates that can basically pay a strategist to go and run their campaign for them, someone who is running a grassroots campaign has to be inherently involved in every single detail of their campaign. One of the first scenes in the movie involves Amy Villela making her own homemade signs out of spray paint and cardboard. One of the other examples of this in the film is Paula Jean Swearingen going to an abandoned location to personally clean it up to use for a campaign rally. Working through the rain, I might add. Another instance is a series of shots of Cori Bush taking pictures throughout her district for print and online ads. The very opening scene of the film is Alexandria talking about how women are supposed to present themselves as candidates and how that compares and contrasts to the way that men are expected to present themselves in the same light. Basically, it's a bit more difficult for women, you might say. <laughs> Don't I know it. All four of these women put out incredibly strong platforms in public, but for me, it's the private moments where they wonder if they are even up to the challenge of running these campaigns that humanizes them the most. There is a moment where Paula Jean is preparing to speak at a large conference, and she is incredibly nervous backstage about messing up. She knows that there are various stereotypes about people from her state, and she just doesn't want to be seen as another one of those stereotypes. 
One of the organizers at the event reassures her and tells her that the people that she is speaking to are more interested in her as a person and her being herself than they are in the words on the page that she is reading off of. They want to know that they have someone like them in their corner. Another difficulty that the film focuses on is that of canvassing and trying to build a support base from the ground up. This involves petitions, going door to door, and going to public events to meet people in person. If you want to run for Congress, you have to get a certain number of signatures on the ballot and often the establishment will try to make it as difficult as possible to get signatures to count. For example, the actual requirement for the number of signatures in AOC's district to get on the ballot is 1250, but because these signatures have to be so perfect, they have to make sure that they get as many as they can. A lot of these will be written out because of illegibility, misspellings, and they just need to make sure that they get all their ducks in a row before they submit the paperwork, otherwise they could be drawn out in court for more time and not have enough time to actually run the grassroots campaign. There are the big plastic mailers that establishment candidates like Joe Crowley send out, which AOC definitely notes do not include the election date or any commitments to specific issues in that community. And then there is the work of actually going out in the community and connecting with the people that you are going to represent. While an area like Alexandria's district might be smaller and more densely populated, candidates like Amy have a bigger challenge because their districts encompass hundreds of miles and dozens of towns. This is, of course, a heavy consequence of the practice of gerrymandering districts after each census, and this is actually an issue that plagues my home district in Michigan. If you look at a map of Michigan, seen here, District 1, which is the district that I'm registered in, covers the entirety of the Upper Peninsula and a good chunk of the Lower Peninsula, which constitutes I think almost a third of the state's land area. Grassroots candidates in areas like this not only have to deal with the hundreds of miles of driving to speak to constituents in dozens of towns and cities, but for someone like Paula Jean, who was running in a statewide race, and Amy, who's running in a huge district, that means having to talk to many, many different people with diverse opinions and needs. In a perfect world, a candidate would be able to knock on the door of every single one of their constituents and have meaningful conversations with them, but this is sadly not the case. Regardless, what this hands-on approach from each of these four women highlights is how directly invested and connected they are to the community that they are trying to represent. They care deeply about their communities, and that connection plants seeds that are there long after their campaigns end. For a start, the progressive policies that have been pushed by brand new Congress, Justice Democrats, and the candidates that they have put forward have now gained mainstream attention thanks to the House flipping blue again in 2018. More and more working Americans are embracing these ideas, and as a result, they are expecting the candidates that they elect to office to share these ideas as well. This has either forced established Democrats to embrace more progressive policies, or it has resulted in more established Democrats losing their seats to more progressive candidates. In the two years since the 2018 midterms and the year since this documentary was released, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has all but been guaranteed a second term representing New York's 14th district, and she has also become a leading voice in House Judiciary hearings as well as growing her online presence. Paula Jean Swearingen ran again in 2020 for the other U.S. Senate seat for West Virginia, and she is now heading into the general election as the Democratic nominee. Amy Valela has unfortunately chosen not to run again in Nevada, but she has remained an outspoken activist. And Cori Bush has arguably been the biggest success story since this documentary was released. After losing her 2018 primary to Lacey Clay, whose family had been representing Missouri's first district for over 50 years, Cori Bush ran again in 2020 and this time beat Lacey Clay in the primary, becoming the Democratic nominee for Missouri's first district. As her district is safely blue, Cori Bush will likely win the general election and she will become the first black woman to represent Missouri in the U.S. House of Representatives. Toward the middle and the end of this documentary, 
The women offer the observation that in order for one of us to get through, a hundred of us have to run. In 2018, this was definitely the case with record numbers of women, people of color, and openly LGBTQ people running for office. But Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was one of the few to actually make it into Congress. The large number of election losses suffered by these progressive candidates could have led to the thesis statement of knock down the house being that these types of campaigns just aren't going to work. But even if they didn't win, a lot of these candidates drew in larger than expected percentages of the votes, which means that the movement is there and the movement is only growing stronger. And as in the case of Cory Bush, more people who reflect the people they represent will be elected as the movement spreads. And so despite the losses, the film ends on the hopeful and high note of one hardworking Latina waitress joyfully witnessing her victory against the establishment candidate. When Alexandria visits the U.S. Congress in the days following her victory, she tells of a time where her dad took her to Washington, D.C. when she was a little girl. According to her, her father pointed out everything around them and told her, this belongs to us. And he's right. This country and this legislature and these representatives, they belong to us, the American people and we should have more of a say in what they do. And with the help of people like Alexandria, like Paula Jean, like Corey, like Amy, we have the power to make a change and make sure that the people of the United States Congress work for us again. Overall, I really enjoyed Knock Down the House. I think it's a wonderfully structured documentary. And even though I wish that it had given more equal time to each of its four candidates, I think it serves as a compelling glimpse at what it is really like to run a grassroots campaign against the establishment. And it serves as a message to remind people that their voice matters. And so, in a not so subtle segue, if you are an American citizen, you need to make sure that one, you are registered to vote, and two, that you have a concrete plan for voting. If you are voting absentee, you must make sure that you mail in or drop off your ballot in time. Express mail it if you have to. I personally voted absentee from abroad. My ballot arrived in Michigan a couple weeks ago. If you also live abroad and you're unsure of how to vote at this point, you can go to votefromabroad.gov for more information and help. And if you are planning to vote in person, whether early or on election day, Make sure to stay safe, wear a mask, keep socially distanced, and make sure you have enough time to stand in line and get your vote in. And as a reminder, if you are in line after the polls close, stay in line. They have to make sure that you can cast your vote. Make sure you know as much as possible about the candidates in your area and what they stand for as well. I, of course, voted for Joe Biden for president. Thank you. This is going to be the most unusual election that we have ever had in recent memory. And it's up to us to make sure that we are as prepared as we can possibly be and that we are prepared to wait as long as it takes to get an accurate result. I will put helpful voting links in the description below and I will also place a link to knock down the house down there as well. It is available to watch for free in full on Netflix's YouTube channel, so I highly encourage you to check it out, especially as the election day looms closer. Honest to God, I liked watching this movie, but this was a tough review to put together, and I'm very glad I did it, and I just want to thank you so much if you have made it this far. I know this was a long one. If you like what I do here and you would like to see more of my Women in Film reviews, you can subscribe down below. I also have a second channel just for vlogging where I just posted a video about why I like Little Mix so much, which you can check out as well. If you aren't yet, you can become a patron of mine on Patreon. You have another monthly movie commentary coming up before the end of October, so get excited for that. You can check out all of my work, past and present, all in one place at helen grotheistcom Be sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for all of my musings and such. I will try to post more helpful information as it comes closer to election day. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's video. I truly, truly appreciate it. As always, remember to keep living awesome lives, remember to vote, and I will see you guys back here in two weeks.
<laughs> Bye.